Well, it's beautiful here in Wisconsin, so I'm sure some last minute running around too. It's, it's cloudy here in Colorado, most definitely. We had a gorgeous day yesterday, but it's definitely cloudy today. All right, so we are going to get started. Um, maybe people will trickle in. Um, since it's only the four of us, um, do you, do, Yumeli, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, you teach and what you teach? I uh, teach uh, Spanish level three, four, and AP here in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Okay, Delaware. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Kristen, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us where you are? I am currently serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tirana, Albania, and I'm here as a secondary English teacher trainer. So I'm doing a lot of classes, um, just professional development classes with teachers around the country. Nice. Yeah. Nice to meet both of you. Well, thank you for having this webinar. I think it's definitely something um, technology related that our teachers could actually do here. So it's going to be helpful. I'm going to share this information with them. Great. Yeah. You don't need a lot of technology for, for this project, actually. Exactly. And everybody here has smartphones, so Great. we're good. Yeah. Well, um, I'm Edvige. Uh, I'm the director of the Elevate program. And uh, I'll tell you, I have two slides about the Elevate program. So I'll give you a very brief overview. Um, but um, I want to introduce Amanda. Amanda um, is a student in the Elevate program. And in the spring, she took a course called Tools in Practice. And it's a 10-week course. And every week, we look at a different family of technologies. And so we looked at um, gamification strategies. And I mean, I was not teaching the course, but they, they look at 10 different um, and 10 social medias. And yeah, social media. Um, every week was dedicated to a new topic. And so um, also as part of the course, starting week two, all the students had to develop a pretty extensive technology project. Everything was very scaffolded. And this is Amanda's final project, uh, QR Code Scavenger Hunt. Uh, Amanda is also a uh, Spanish teacher at Wayland Academy in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background information. Amanda, if you want to move to slide one. Um, we started the um, Elevate program last fall. Um, it's something that I had been working on for four years to get it approved. Uh, it's a fully online certificate program. It's 16 graduate credits. And we have a combination of one credit, two credit, and three credit hour courses. And all the courses are hands-on and they're project-based. So every, almost every week, teachers do lesson planning or brainstorm activities. Um, and uh, the cost of the program right now is $320 per credit, um, graduate credit hour. Go ahead and go to the second and last slide. This is our summer. Uh, these are our summer courses. We're offering four courses this summer. Uh, the, we'll have a second language acquisition and teaching methods course. Uh, it's a 10 week course. It's mostly the, the it's mostly theory and teaching methods. Um, I'll be teaching a digital games and language learning course. It's an eight week course. Again, it's completely online. Same thing for this course. I think we'll have, um, topics that we'll cover for two weeks. So we'll have like four main topics. And then um, I'm also teaching the Teaching Languages Online course, which will be great for you, Amanda, because you're teaching Spanish online. Yeah. Um, and we also have the Virtual Immersion course, which is a course for language teachers who wanted to improve their own language proficiency um, in any language. It doesn't have to be the language that they teach, but you know, sometimes I know that teachers want to get a second certification in, a, in another language. So that's a good way. Students in that course are paired with a language partner. And then we sit down at the beginning of the course and we determine learning goals. So this is our program. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and if not, I think we can just um, go ahead and jump in and learn about QR codes and uh, Amanda's project. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to mute their microphone. I'm going to mute my microphone as well. Uh, if you have questions, just put them in the chat room and I'll, I'll interrupt Amanda. Sounds good? Okay. All right, I'm going on mute. Well, welcome everyone. As Edwidge was just saying, my final project for last class was our QR code project. 
And I really wanted to do something with my students from my Spanish 2 class because I tend to, that's my, my larger class. There's 12 students in the class. I know not everyone's reality, but um, for me, it, my 12 person class is, um, gets a little crazy sometimes because they're freshmen and sophomores. So I wanted to have it as a more active activity. So I decided to use the QR codes. And as you can read here on the screen, uh, I wanted to have them work in teams and also to be able to learn more about the Dominican Republic, which I'll talk about in a minute, is the book that we're reading. So they were, I was able to print the different QR codes and then I hid them all around campus. Our campus, um, as Edwige was saying, I teach at Whalen Academy and it's in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. We have about 200 total students and it's really set up as a college campus it looks like a college campus with different buildings that the students travel back and forth and they have the freedom to go outside um, we don't have specific study halls where the students need to be so I know that um, compared to some other teaching situations you may have to adjust the program uh, for this project but you could even have it in one building on different floors or um, different clues in different classrooms if teachers weren't using their classrooms so that's kind of a, a big picture I also wanted it to um, have the students have some evaluation process and be able to kind of give ideas afterwards so I'll show you that evaluation Okay, so here. So in Spanish 2, the students uh, were reading Felipe Aloa, and it is a book that I teach through TPRS, which is Teaching Proficiency Through Reading and Storytelling. So it's a comprehensible input uh, process where the students, everything I say in class in Spanish, they are understanding, or I write the English equivalent, or I act it out, etc. They don't learn grammar per se, but they learn it more in context, the way that you would teach a first, your, uh, like a first language um, child. So the students were reading this novel, and uh, it's a great novel for the level twos because it really, it has a present tense as well as the past tense, and this um, book has a really great message about kind of overcoming the racism and, and really following your goal and, and succeeding. So the students really loved it. And I have a lot of boys in this class too, so they really connected with the, the baseball part and they were helping me with all the, the different components of baseball, which is, it's new for me, unfortunately. I have to get my, my sports vocabulary up. So, um, the, but I wanted, again, coming back to why I want to do the QR code is that I really wanted to give them some more background about what's happening um, back in the 50s in the Dominican as well as current day and the differences between living in a dictatorship as, um, as opposed to the democracy. So that's why I chose this project. So first of all, what is a QR code? So as you can see on the right side of the uh, screen over here, it kind of looks like a barcode. And so the QR stands for quick response and it was extremely easy to set up. You don't have to be a tech savvy person to be able to, to jump into this project. So you go into a generator, so on your, your computer. I like using the qrstuff.com. There's many of them, uh, options out there, but I like this one because you can print out the codes in different colors and it's just really straightforward. So it's a great website. And you have different data types that you get to connect the QR code. So basically, I'll show you that in the next screen, but you're going to connect different options or different links to each of the, the QR codes. And then um, from your cell phone or an iPad also, if the students don't have access to their cell phones during the day, you download an app. It's a QR scanner. There's many free ones available and it acts as a scanner. So wherever that code is, the students just put their, they activate their phones and they scan it and it automatically links them. So we're not wasting the time of having them type in URLs or kind of going back and forth. It's just instant, which is definitely a benefit. Um, and we found out actually in the process, because I wanted the students to be able to document some um, of their fun kind of moments that I was missing because I couldn't follow them through the whole QR, um, through the scavenger hunt part. I asked them to Snapchat. 
and it Snapchat actually acts as a QR scanner too. So they didn't have to have two apps open on their phone. They got to just use their Snapchat app and scan the codes and then also be able to um, take pictures and send me little videos of the, of the students working through the, the process. So that was great. Let's see. Okay, so as I was indicating, there are several data types. So once you go into the website, the qrstuff.com, it has all these different options. And so, and I'll show you the different types of codes that I did shortly. But as you can see, there's many different options open to you. So you can have them linking to a URL, you can have them linking to a YouTube video or to map if you wanted to have it more as a true scavenger hunt, try to get them to different locations in a town, for example, that would be a great idea. Or if you wanted them to look at a specific Instagram. Um, I also used a lot of the plain text option over here as a, um, to give them more information. So I would have them, I would put a phone number in there and then list the like four bullets of what they had to do once they called this mystery number. And so it, it was a great way to combine the different tasks or if you want to have them email, etc. So there's a lot of different possibilities that you can do. So uh, here are my learning objectives. I really wanted the students to work together in teams. I find especially um, as well, I worked in public school before I came to this private school, but the students, we don't give them enough scaffolding of true teamwork. And so what I was finding is that a few students would be the head of the team and then the other ones would just kind of go along in different activities that I did. So I wanted an activity that each student needed to truly collaborate and to work together and solve the clues. So I created different clues that knowing my students of my kinesthetic learners or my math geniuses and trying to figure out which um, type of clues so that way each one of them would be able to be a, a god or goddess, as I say, um, of the, the task. So meaning that they would be able to be in charge of a, a task too. I also wanted them to do problem solving skills and then just going through the different um, items that, that we, as we think of our learning op objectives of comparing and contrasting and then also being able to, to do that presentation part of being able to talk about what worked well for them, what didn't work well, what do we wanna change. So again, as Edwige was saying, this was designed for a Spanish two class. You could change it for any level though. Um, my students are ninth and 10th graders and this is their second year of uh, Spanish. RCP is our college prep level. So it's our regular level as opposed to our honors level. And they have medium to strong command of the Spanish language. They are able to express and especially understand preterite and imperfect and the future tenses and then being able to, to um, output is a little lower so and there's 12 students in the class I divided the 12 students into groups of three with four students each and actually at the beginning I wasn't sure how I wanted to do that if I wanted to divide them myself and so I asked the students and they really wanted to choose their own partners but some of them told me privately you know I really don't want to be with so and so and so I had them just write on a card who did they want in their groups and then who did they not want in their groups and I was able to to pair them together so that way they they were in the groups that they wanted to work with too for the most part uh, in our course, we had also talked a lot about gamification strategies in that section, and I really wanted to, to incorporate a puzzle also. So the scavenger hunt is a puzzle in itself because the students are trying to solve the different clues, but then the actual act of putting together a jigsaw is just something that, that was fascinating me as I started researching the different parts of my literature review. So I decided, I wanted to, to get some visuals in there and to create the puzzles to then be able to have kind of a post activity of kind of reviewing their different clues, but then also having the next level of a conversation. So talking about the history of the flag or the different fruits that are available in the tropics compared to here in Wisconsin is a little bit different. And then many students in this class absolutely love music. And so I wanted to really bring in that music component and the different instruments 
and talking about the exchange rate and the different colors in, in art also that's in money. I just find it fascinating. So what I did is I found these four pictures on the um, internet, which I do have the URLs, um, so I can send them to you if you would like. I'm not trying to violate copyright. And then I put them into jigsawplanet.com. And this is a great website for creating your own jigsaw. And it's an online jigsaw um, that you put any picture in there and then it automatically just makes it into the, the jigsaw puzzle. What I thought would be great is as they would solve a clue is they would get a piece of a puzzle. And so they would just be getting these pieces. So I, I cut out, or I, I used one of my Snagit um, apps that I have on my computer and I was able to capture just the pieces of the different puzzles and then as the students completed different tasks I then sent them pieces of the puzzle and so it was another part of just inquiry for the students they really liked and then at the end the next day actually because our period um, got away from us so the next day I had four different iPads set up put up to their jigsawplanet.com to their different pieces and then they were able to put that puzzle together and then figure out oh well, we have a flag what do you guys have in the target language and then I, I had them do a little bit more research so it was a fun part of a kind of a post activity not just sitting there talking about well what worked and what didn't it was another level of culture that they got to explore so getting to the clues, I wanted a combination of all the different skills and I wanted to be able to work, um, kind of put some new fun things in. So here I have 12 uh, clues that I did. And so uh, I'm friends with Carol Gabb. She's the author of the book and she agreed to be able to be available that morning. So the students actually, we we're gonna have it a FaceTime call and then we were having some issues um, with the technology on FaceTime for some reason. So instead I flipped it to a Skype link, which again, using that QR, <clears throat> excuse me, QR stuff website, it was really easy to just change that link. So I changed it to a Skype phone call and they had no idea that they were calling the author of the book. And so it was awesome. They, I had them um, just dial this phone and they, Carol Gobb was on their, their screen and none of them knew what she looked like or anything. And she just, she spoke with them only in Spanish and the students had to ask questions and figure out who on earth is this woman in front of us and what's her connection with Felipe Aloa. And so it was, I think, one of the most exciting parts for the students. They really appreciated that. And then afterwards, they're like, oh my gosh, you know an author. I was like, yeah, I'm pretty famous. No, not at all. <laughs> so it was, it was really fun for them to do that. I also like to do uh, some com combination of the level of reading for the students at the level two level, but then also having authentic readings. So I chose, some, um, I chose a couple different readings. Um, regarding Felipe Aloa and about the Dominican Republic. And then I had, instead of editing the websites, I just had editing the task. And so on the QR code, I had it as the text option and I just asked specific questions that I wanted them to answer. And it was more like looking for the, the like, to differentiate the instruction. So I knew that some groups had a little lower of level and some were higher. So then I was able to give each group a reading at their level. And so I was able to, to give the lower level, for example, uh, questions just about like the headings and about um, the really obvious things in an article. And then my higher level students that I wanted to challenge a little bit more, I had them, my questions in English and they had to figure out the answers in Spanish. And then they had another link that they then submitted answers. I had some throughout the, the scavenger hunt they had to submit for uh, through Google Form, some did through Google Docs, and some I had a whole bunch of different um, linkings for them. Uh, we just had a diversity day the Friday before that class, or the week before that class, so I wanted to connect that, connect, 
connect that lesson with what was happening with Felipe Aloa in the 50s, being a black man in the United States and what was happening there. So we were able to connect some of those um, lessons too, which was really great. Um, and then we had some videos. I had have them specific questions and they had to leave a, <coughs> excuse me, a voicemail message for me. So it linked to my cell phone, which my voicemail on my cell phone is in both English and Spanish. And so then they didn't get to see me because they were out you know, on campus and they had to just leave the voicemail. So it was kind of funny listening to them talk back and forth and then leave the voicemail as opposed to just being able to see me face to face and be able to see my reactions and help them. So that was a fun part too. For my kinesthetic learners, I had another teacher available at one of the stops along and the students had to create a body puzzle. And so they had to connect all each other and then get out of the, the knot too. So some of it was just silly things that I added in. Then as you can see, here are some of our other clues. We had um, some refranes, some sayings, and having them connect, well, what does this exactly mean? And what could it, how would you translate it to make sense in English, for example? And then I had some baseball statistics, both our baseball coach and our math instructors helped me create some word problems, because again, I'm not a baseball girl. So they were able to connect um, the, that cross-cultural or cross-curricular um, connection and the students is that too. Amanda, um, you may asks whether you had different QR codes for each group at each clue. Yes, I'm going to show you um, what that looked like. So I had a total of the 12 clues, but I changed the colors of the clues and the order that each student or each group was solving. And so you'll see that in the next slide. Thank you for that question. Um, my students love to eat, they're teenagers, so clue number nine, they had a blind food tasting, and so I had a bunch of different fruits that maybe they hadn't tasted yet, um, and plus they had a blindfold on, so that it was that trust level of that they were tasting these things and different textures, so that was fun. And then we have a Mexican um, market right down the street here, and so I took some of the, I bought some of the Latino sodas, so the... Um, all the different flavors of the pineapple soda and the um, guava soda and the grapefruit. The students, it was really funny to watch them try to figure all of those flavors out. And then I did have some bonus questions because I knew, again, I had differentiated instruction. I had some of my um, higher level students knowing that they would go through the clues faster. So clue 11 and 12 are really for those students. And so we had um, another website at a history um, website that was all about um, the dictator Trujillo. And then there was some map reading skills also. Okay. So to answer your question, the, all the clues were the same for the different students, except for the reading that I had, that there were the different levels. But for example, the quest one, so quest just represented each of the teams. And they went from clue one, two, three, four, et cetera. But then quest two started at clue 10 and then went to clue nine and clue eight. And how I organized that is I just made the QR codes different colors. And then I print them, printed them actually on color paper also. And then I hid them all around campus. And so they had to go from clue to clue. And at the once they solved a clue, then they got a text to tell them another like thing, like, for example, I wanted them to go to the Elodi building, which is the senior boys dorm. And so I had them, um, I put a little fact about Elodi. And then I wanted them to go over to the school store. So I put a little fact about the school store. So they had to go to that one for clue seven, for example. And all of those clues, it got them more connected with our campus and the history of Wayland. So it was another interesting uh, component of this that they really got to, okay, what do I know about Wayland and connecting with our history too, instead of just the, the foreign culture. Does that make sense about how I organize the clues? Make sure to unmute if you want to ask questions, guys. 
Uh, do you mind repeating uh, about the color codes and the clues number for each of the groups? Sure. Okay. So each of the, I'm going to go back a slide. Okay. So for example, see how this clue won? It was the Skype call to Carol Gobb. And then what I did is each team completed that clue, but it was in a different order. And so I made this document on Word to kind of create my map of clues, if you will. And so I started quest one, just clue one, all the way to clue 12. And this team was team yellow, for example. And so each one of their clues was on a yellow piece of paper. And then I had their QR code, because you can print them in different colors too. So I had theirs just in black. And so this team went from clue one, two, three, in normal numerical order. Then team two went here. Um, they started with clue 10. So like clue one was located in our dining hall, for example. Mm -hmm. But clue 10 was over in Wayland Hall, which is our, our underclassmen boys dorm. And so... The students, I, the reason I did different colors and different orders is I didn't want all 12 students or even two teams being at the same clue at the same time. And because I wanted each team to have that challenge component. And so I was able to kind of figure out, and I only mixed up on a couple of how much time it would be to complete each clue. So they were able to be in different parts of the campus mm -hmm. and that way they weren't stepping over each other. Mm -hmm. And they had different colors too. So they didn't know that each, that all of them were solving the same clues. Mm -hmm. And that helped also because it was, oh, they didn't feel like they wanted to, to click on a yellow or scan a yellow code, for example, because the green team was so interested in all their green clues. And then afterwards, when I explained to them how I did it, they were like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. So it was less work for me because I only had to come up with 12 clues and I just had to hide them in different order. That makes sense. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, then after the, um, so the second day after the, the scavenger hunt. The students then, we had I had the, that class start and they've solved the puzzle. And then that conversation regarding the different things that were in the puzzle. And then they talked verbally within their groups and um, with me. And this this evaluation part, I had them speak in English because they are only at a Spanish two level. And I really wanted to get more feedback of how I could fix the scavenger hunt. And they just don't have that vocabulary in Spanish yet. So I had them do a Google form. I had them actually each team do a Google form. And so I asked questions like, what did you learn yesterday and today? And then what would you like to change regarding the scavenger hunt itself um, if we do this again? And then I had, I think there was uh, 10 questions. I just gave you a couple um, samples today. So each team, so there's the four teams, each team answered them together. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to them to do it together on that day, but it turned out that because of weather here in Wisconsin, we ended up having a snowstorm also. So everything was pushed and it was my last day before spring break. And so I, they still wanted, we were, it was scheduled for that day to make guacamole too. So the students really wanted to get to the guacamole part. And if I had each one do their evaluation, they all decided it would take too long. So I, I had them do it together, which was an interesting way of doing evaluations too. So they did learn different things, like I, I said. Um, it was interesting to hear for me that the question two, they said, what would you want to change? They would want to change their group, which again, they chose the members of their group. So I think this was from one of the groups that the boy had just injured his leg and he was in a cast and on crutches. So it slowed the group down a bit. And because they, this team, again, this group has such an intense feeling of competition that I think that's probably where that question or that statement came from. It's nice that they were basically willing to ditch the kid who was on crutches. Exactly. 
<laughs> well, great teamwork. Exactly. I know. And that was the other part of the rules is that you could not ditch any member of your partnership. So parts of the different clues, I had them that you had to take a Snapchat photo of all four of you, or if it was a voicemail, I had to hear all four voices. So I verified that each team was where they needed to be. Because again, it's a large campus. I was at different um, points of it. And I had a couple other teachers helping me, but I didn't, I didn't want to be too controlling. I wanted to give them that space, but still know you are where you're supposed to be. So yeah, the poor boy, he goes verbally to me. He said, yeah, we need to do this when I have two legs <laughs> or two functioning legs, right? Um, they love the interactiveness. They love that they actually work together as teams and all but one team actually, and it wasn't the team with the boy with the, the cast, um, really work together as a team. The other one, again, they chose their team members, but the competitiveness kind of overtook them a bit. And so they needed to slow down. And so the second day, they really were able to talk about that before they started and they slowed themselves down and really started working together. So that was great. And then that's, that poor statement is my group getting down on me when I try my best because he was trying to go as fast as he could. <laughs> so um, regarding the 20th century learning standards, this project really does touch all of um, many of them. I wanted to focus on the kind of, I separated the idea of the standards between which ones were actually demonstrated or utilized in the clues, and then those are marked with asterisks, as opposed to that effective team grouping. And um, so it was a multi-level project, and it was really fascinating to see how the students were able to, to work towards each of the standards. And then, of course, the ACTFL standards, I was working on the interpersonal, interpretive, presentational, and really wanting them to connect more with the Dominican Republic and, and starting to really think about uh, life beyond our campus and using Spanish effectively. So those were our, our major parts. I'm not, let me see if I, okay. So and that's our contact information. So uh, what are your questions? What are your I love this project. I think I, I love getting the kids out of the class. I love the fact that you were able to get them to really collaborate, collaborate together. So I, I think that's, I mean, that was a really strong project. And it really spread throughout our campus as the other students that aren't in my class um, were watching my students run around and get so excited about education. They really started, they started asking their teachers if they could do a QR scavenger hunt too. So I've been able to meet with our science department as well as history to, to really get some ideas going and see if we can spread this cross curricular. So it'll be a lot of fun for our whole campus. Do you think you could organize a cross-curricular scavenger hunt where you would do your hunt with a history teacher, for example, in a kind of team teaching situation? That could definitely be something coming up. For example, our world um, civ class is currently learning about the Mayan and Aztec cultures. Okay. And although it's, we only have three weeks of school left, so it's a little cramped for this year, but I really think that this could be something that we could combine for next year. It and those, a lot of those students are in Spanish one, so it would be another level of a challenge for me to get the clues to their level. But I think that would be fascinating to be able to have the, that cross-curricular and to be able to do the, the outside more ac active activity. Yeah, it's funny that you were mentioning that. I was thinking about uh, Julia Alvarez with uh, you know, the time of the butterflies, it's also the Dominican Republic, and many other you know connections i'm in a math and science school mm -hmm. so i can see the many connections uh, with the other curricular uh, activity so it's a great great project it will take a little bit of time to prepare but i think once you do it then, then you just change this the topic and you can go ahead and it's, it's great it's wonderful Thank you. It did take a little time kind of to get my, my mind around, okay, how am I going to create these codes and kind of that coding map of figuring out, I don't want to, to make hundreds of codes right. and, and different tasks. I really wanted to make it simpler on me too. So just doing the 12 
um, major focus and then having them move around that that definitely took a lot of work out of my my part so, meaning that it lessened my work and now that I've done it once I'm excited to I'll be making one for my two honors class for next week so they're really excited to to adventure in theirs and for Sorry, for the film that you mentioned, the students, um, I haven't watched the In the Time of Butterflies with this class, but I did just do that with my Spanish film class, so I, I think it will be a great connection. Mm -hmm. We did watch Sugar um, with Spanish 2CP after the book, and they absolutely loved another connection with the, the baseball and to be able to, to really hear the Spanish of the Dominicans, and it was great for them to, to be able to connect that way. And I think another cross-curricular would be even to combine with our baseball coach mm -hmm. and having it, yeah. um, because in the movie, they were having a part where their English tutor was teaching them the words home run and um, way to go and words like that. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe even getting out there on the baseball field and being able to play a game of, of Spanish baseball would be pretty fun too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Amanda, quick question from Jody. Um, she would like you to explain the Snapchat as QR code. Okay, so Snapchat is an app that I would probably guarantee all of your teenagers have. It's um, one of those social medias that's very popular with teenagers um, up until young adults. And um, so what it does is that it allows you to take photos of people, but then you can add different imaging on it. So like you can make um, me look like a dog, for example. And so little cartoon ears would appear. And if I had my mouth open, a little cartoon tongue appears. And so each week, Snapchat offers different filters, they're called. And so um, like this week, it had flowers around the head and everything. So the students use Snapchat all the time and they form their own groups and it connects with the contact information in your phone. And so Snapchat connects them and then they can make, <clears throat> excuse me, Snapchat stories and they can put pictures and they can do little videos and things that, so they're already using Snapchat, but that app, actually scans the QR codes also. And it was something that I've, I studied Snapchat for another one of our projects in our Elevate program, but it never said anywhere that it, it scanned QR codes and I never thought of even doing that. So as I opened my Snapchat um, on my phone, after the kids told me, I said, sure enough, as soon as I pretended to take a picture with my Snapchat over a QR code, it just automatically scanned it and brought me to the different links. So the students don't have to download the additional QR reader because they already have Snapchat. So they just, they're, and they're already familiar with that option. Mm -hmm. And I don't Snapchat with my students, but I did, I do have Snapchat on my phone. So we take different pictures and I use that as a storytelling technique. And they also, we do different videos and things. So they get to videotape me when I'm reading and they slow down my voice and they add all different filters. And then I put that on our LMS and then for their homework, they have to watch those again and comment on them, for example, or sometimes I put them in our voice thread. So it's really fun. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen says that you should present your project at W-A-F-L-T, I guess it's the Wisconsin Association of Foreign Language Teachers, and you should definitely do that. But also CCSTFL, I don't know that one. Which one is that one? Uh, is that the one, the Central States? Oh, it's Central States, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and also Jody would like you to present this as a webinar at um, Southwest Cold. So That would be wonderful, yeah. Also, uh, as long as Amanda is okay with it, we are going to launch a new website for uh, the Elevate program and we'll have a showcase page where we'll post the webinar recordings and some of the lesson plans and materials, links and resources so that if you want to do, and contact information. Of course, yeah. yeah. I have a question for Amanda. Would you be available if I contact you for some specific questions as I start working on this? Oh, of course, yes. So I do. I did include my Colorado email here, and I will. Com I'll completely be available. 
I have lots of time, um, especially in June, and um, part of July is some opener time, open time, but I am signed up for all my Elevate classes too. But I would love to help you um, okay. kind of get through the, the initial planning, and I would love to hear how all of you use, um, use this project, because I think it could really, it gives great opportunities for both input and output, and I would love to help you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Nice. So if we don't have any more questions, I think we can all go on with our Saturday plans. Um, I'm going to um, email everybody the recording. Uh, it's probably a big file, so I'll see um, how I do that. But I'll have the recording to everybody by Monday. Sorry I made a mistake when I said um, Monday, May 12th. Monday is not the 12th. Don't no, worry. Um, <laughs> the, the link will be posted. You'll get the recording. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this very much. Thank oh, great. You. I look forward to working with all of you. Okay. Thank you for attending. And thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everybody. Bye.